Hello and welcome back to Russ's Movie Corner. My name is Russ and as you can see I'm sitting in front of my movie corner. I have my Bible epic miniseries right there. My Armor of God t-shirt on which means it's time to take down another atheist. Today on the chopping block is The Truth Hurts and his video entitled Five Animals That Disprove God. And uh, on the previous two videos, we um, kind of went over his intro. I read Genesis chapter 3 about the fall, which we're actually going to get back into today. And uh, we're, um, we were talking about this article called Designed to Kill in a Fallen World. And um, we stopped right here because I, I read um, Isaiah chapter 11 um, down through verse 8. I also read Genesis 1.30 talked a little bit about revelation and the end times kind of tying this whole thing together as how it's like since we live in this fallen world jesus was sent to redeem the world and when he comes back in his second coming he's going to do what isaiah chapter 11 says which is going to have the lion lay down with the lamb bears and oxen and cattle will eat together in harmony will eat beef come vegetarians and uh, there will be no more suffering. So there's that. But um, as we get back into this, um, I just kind of want to say that, you know, it's like as an apologist, this is why we do it. Okay. And I didn't say this the last time, but in Luke 12, 8, he says, Jesus says, And I tell you, every one who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man, will acknowledge before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And every one who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Okay. And that's that's a basic apologist. Um verse passage okay where if we deny jesus before men he's gonna deny us before a father in heaven so why i'm doing this okay i do this because i want people to know that this is why we're here okay as christians this is why we do things okay so let's jump back into the video and then we'll jump back into the actual verses here these harmful designs must have come into play after the curse. I believe that God, who knew what was to come, designed snakes with the genetic information necessary so that they could adapt to a cursed world. Yet, we know that the snakes' present killing designs are temporary. God promises once again to make vipers safe to handle. Now let me get this right. Douglas Oliver is stating that God, with his foreknowledge, created snakes to be herbivorous, but gave them the genetic information necessary so that over time they can change, they can swap, they can evolve into being obligate carnivores. Why not? But in future, they will revert back to their original nature of being herbivorous. Yes, we read Why that. Why not just create them herbivorous, inside the Garden of Eden and herbivorous outside the Garden of Eden. Because I don't think that they were herbivorous inside the Garden of Eden. I actually don't think they were herbivorous. And maybe they were. Maybe they were just, you know, eating certain things, you know, inside as they were as they were doing certain passage, you know, do, as they were doing certain things, they may have been herbivorous. And I don't know if God gave them the genetic information to start mixing the neurotoxins then, or if maybe God directed them to have that afterwards. I don't know. I'm not God. Neither is this guy, and neither is Douglas Oliver. Okay? We don't know why God made things the way he did. He's God. He can make them however he wanted. If he wanted to make them venomous in the Garden of Eden, who are you to say that they can't be. You see what I'm saying here? A lot of people might say, ooh, that's an argument from authority. Well, yes it is, because God is the ultimate authority, okay? And when I'm saying I'm arguing from authority, I'm arguing from this, the Holy Scriptures, okay? Where's your proof?
Come on. Where's your proof? Why are snakes venomous in the first place? Why would they have needed venom? I mean, why are some snakes non-venomous and other snakes venomous? Like I was saying in my last one, I had to garter snake outside. I almost stepped on him once. Poor thing. He was sitting out in the middle of the of the walkway, and I walked by, and he almost stepped on his tail. Poor thing. I wasn't wasn't watching where I was looking, because I wasn't expecting the garter snake to just be sitting out in the middle of the of the concrete walkway. So, I mean, why is that one non venomous and a rattlesnake venomous? Why is the non venomous one still around? If it is more evolutionarily advantageous to have the venom to be able to paralyze your prey to make it easier to swallow, why would a garter snake not have venom? Corn snakes, bull snakes, there's a ton of snakes out there that don't have venom. It comes back to when this guy, the same guy that I'm talking about right here, okay, had a musk turtle that needed this whole list of things to stay alive, and if one of them was out of balance, it wouldn't survive. And he's like, I have a hard time believing that my little turtle will be on the ark. Well, your turtle wasn't on the ark, but there were turtles on the ark. As evidenced by the fact that you had a turtle. <laughs> How else would there not be turtles? Okay. So there were snakes on the ark. And some of them were venomous and some of them were not. And the venomous ones reproduced after their venomous kind and the non-venomous ones reproduced after their non-venomous kind. Okay. We know that. That's what I'm saying. You're not God. And you're forgetting that third bullet point right there. Why don't we see cold-blooded killers of gazelles, sheep, cows, and horses? You can forget microevolution. What Douglas Oliver is asserting is the most hyper-intensive, rapid form of macro-evolution to ever take place on our planet. And amazingly, and it scares me slightly to say this, a couple of years ago, I would have said something very similar to him. I would have said, well, snakes behave the way they do today, yes, but they would never have behaved like that before 6,000 years ago and the fall of man. Why not? Why would that scare you to say that? So the Lord God said to the serpent, This is your punishment. You are singled out from among all the domestic and wild animals of the whole earth to be cursed. You shall grovel in the dust as long as you live, crawling on your belly. From now on, you and the woman will be, em will be enemies, and your offspring and hers. You will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. That's the Living Bible translation. But back to the New Revised Standard Version. Says, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Dust. Wait. Didn't he call man dust in that same passage? Hang on a second. Let me look at that. Yeah. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife... And have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat 
the plants of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now wait a minute. He says to the snake, Dust you shall eat all the days of your life, and we're dust. I think it's pretty freaking clear, my man. Do we need a third translation? Let's grab a third translation. Because why not? We don't have anything better to do. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, the most cursed of all animals shall you be. And of all wild beasts, on your belly you shall crawl and eat dust as long as you live. It says, Cursed shall be the ground through you, and suffering you shall gain your living from it as you as long as you live. Thorns and thistles shall it produce for you, so that you will have to eat wild plants. By the sweat of your brow you shall eat you earn your living until you return to the ground, since it was from it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you will return. pretty damn clear that he's basically telling the snake that you're going to be you're going to be eating from dust and he tells the man that you're dust the animals where did they come from they're dust too because we found that all of the that all of the elements that we contain in our bodies are also present in a lot of living things. So he's basically telling the the serpent, you're going to crawl in the dust and you're going to eat dust. And he tells the man, for you are dust, and from dust you were made, and dust you will return to when you die. And what happens when we die? We decompose into what? Dust. We sometimes get cremated where we get turned into ash, which is a fine dust, right? That we sprinkle on the ground in memory of our loved ones. From dust you came, dust you will return. It's pretty damn simple. Don't know how I can say it any plainer than that. Unfortunately, the evidence of the fossil record smashes that concept to pieces. No, it doesn't. This 67 million year old fossil, originally unearthed Supposedly. in 1987, reveals an 11 and a half foot snake coiled around sauropod eggs and a hatchling. Despite its great size, this snake lacked the ability to open its mouth as wide as many modern snakes can. It likely could not fit an entire sauropod egg in its mouth. Hmm. Instead, paleontologist Jeff Wilson suggests that the snake waited for the eggs to hatch to consume the hatchlings. So then, <clears throat> if it couldn't fit an entire egg in its mouth, then wouldn't a microevolutionary advantageous mutation occur that maybe gave it a hinged jaw? Could this have been a serpent from right after the fall, before the flood. Because we know from the previous video on Noah's flood that the pre-flood world would have been radically different than the post-flood world. And that maybe this snake was waiting for this sauropod hatchling and got covered in mud and died because of the flood. Now, He's going to say something here. I'm going to let it let this play. He's going to say something here that I'm absolutely going to facepalm. He said that they may have been somewhat collapsible, so you can fold their ribs up a bit and get them in your mouth. Well, from a human perspective, it may seem cruel that snakes take the life of a sauropod within the first minute of it hatching. There are some snakes today which don't even wait that long. They survive by scavenging bird nests, 
and consuming the eggs. To best equip them for this, God decided not to give them fangs or teeth. Instead, he provided them with tiny bone projections coming from the cervical vertebrae which extend to crush the egg once it's swallowed. I find it fascinating that the majority of members of the world's three major monotheistic religions will tell you in no uncertain terms that God is against the taking of an unborn life or of a newborn. And yet that same God appears to have created many animals which steal and kill the unborn fetuses of other animals or devour their newborn. Oh, Lord, help me. Have you ever eaten an egg? My God, are you idiot! Oh, Lord, save me from the idiots of the world! All right. Let's go back. Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all of the earth. And every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to every living, th and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that everything He made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. And in 2.15, Then Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may eat freely of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you will surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone, so I will make a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the cattle, and to all the birds of the air, and to all the beasts of the field. But for the man there was not a helper found for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib um, which the Lord God had taken from the man given to the woman. So he basically told... He basically told the man he has dominion over every living thing. Okay? Now, in Exodus, okay, in chapter 20, God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your cattle, or the sojourner who is within your gates. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. 
Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor covet your neighbor's wife, or manservant, maidservant, or his axe, or his ass, or anything that is your neighbor's. Pretty damn clear there in verse 13. He's talking about human beings. Are you stupid? Okay, PETA. And I'm not talking about the character in the Hunger Games. I'm talking about people for the ethical treatment of animals. Which they're not very ethical, but that's a whole other video entirely. Okay, PETA. God is talking about humans. Absolute moron. I can't with these people anymore. Okay? Stop it. You're comparing apples and oranges. Okay? Because... God clearly states in other passages that we have dominion over other animals to have them for food. Okay? So like I said, if you've ever eaten a chicken's egg, then you're just as guilty as that snake. If you've ever eaten bacon, you're just as guilty as the snake. If you've ever eaten any animal ever at all, you are as guilty as the snake. In this guy's eyes, that's what he's comparing it to. He's comparing a snake eating a bird's egg to a person having an abortion. How crass can you get? How idiotic can you seem if this is your argument? I'm watching this video going, how dumb can you be? That's why I said, okay, PETA. This is the first thing that popped into my head. Okay, PETA. Settle down there. You're comparing two different things. Apples and oranges. Because <laughs> over here you're saying, oh, a snake eating a bird egg. God would never want that to happen, right? Because he clearly states over here that he doesn't want to kill unborn children. No. That's not what we're doing here, dude. It has nothing to do with that. Nothing at all. And I'm sorry that you feel that that's your calling or whatever to state, but that is absolute idiocy. Plain and simple. Absolute. The death of a 17-year-old boy from a box jellyfish sting near Bamaga on Cape York has left a community in mourning and raised questions over whether more can be done to prevent these tragic incidents. To my Christian mind... Well, I would think that, you know, you have people study the box jellyfish, study where they're going, what they're doing, what their migration patterns are, and when there's a swarm of box jellyfish, maybe close down the beach! Hmm? The existence of animals such as box jellyfish, in particular species such as Chironex brachiri, the world's most venomous marine animal, presented a perplexing stumbling block to my worldview. I had no rational explanation as to why this god would create such absurd anomalies. On the one hand, I was indoctrinated to believe very anthropocentrically that we are God's chosen species. Yes, that we are. That we were made in his image. Yes, we are. That all non-human life is merely a biological mechanism, an engine running in the background yep. to ensure the health of our planet and the pleasure and enjoyment of our species upon it. Yes, very On much so. On the other hand, I ask myself questions such as, why does this god feel the need to provide species such as Chironix flakiri 
with such a potent, powerful venom, which could kill around 50 humans in under two minutes. God covered each of its up to 15 tentacles in millions of tiny darts loaded with poison. Yeah. They inject their incredibly powerful venom into blood vessels just beneath the skin, mm -hmm. where it travels rapidly and eventually reaches the heart. I personally can't help but just imagine the conversation going on in heaven between God and Jesus when creating these sorts of animals. That never existed. Jesus turned to God saying, what, what are you doing? The venom you've provided for them is so powerful that if it comes into contact with a human, it can cause serious injury or death. And God just saying, well, I'm God. It's Yahweh or the highway. And Jesus kind of is completely flabbergasted, but he says, okay, well, if you have to make them, at least create them so that they're vibrant red in colour, so that they stand out. And also so that they give some sort of alarm noise, uh, so that it warns humans away from them. So both humans can see them and hear them, and therefore avoid them. God just says, well, I've already clicked enter. They're already in the oceans. This is what happens when postmodernism infects a person's mind. <laughs> Jellyfish can be eaten by whales. Certain animals have developed resistance to the toxins, and they can eat them in the sea. So again, it's part of the ecosystem. And again, like snakes, there are problems within if you just would snap your fingers and get rid of them, okay? So I've been to the beach. I've seen jellyfish on the shore, okay? They're just, you know, they just lay there because they, the tide went out. They were kind of stuck in the sand and they couldn't, they couldn't pick themselves up. They can't pick themselves up and go as easily, okay? And my mom saying, my dad saying, don't touch that. It's deadly. It comes down to if a person comes into contact with a jellyfish, it's going to hurt. It could potentially get, it could potentially kill you. Because... There are millions of people that are stung by jellyfish every year, and only a few of them actually die. Because, like, I'm, I'm sure that what happened was that kid came into contact, and, and it was a small child, so they have a smaller body, the venom gets to the heart much quicker, so that's why that child perished when he was stung by the jellyfish. Is it a sad thing? Yes, it is. But, um, by the same token, it's, it's something where, you know, like when we study red tides, right? And we say, hey, there's a red tide, don't go swimming. If a person chooses to go swimming in a red tide and they swallow it and they end up ingesting the poison, they end up dying, that's their fault. We can track jellyfish blooms. We can know when they're going to be, when there's a bloom of jellyfish and they just a, a, a mass of them. And we can say, you know what? <laughs> there's a whole bunch of jellyfish out there right now. Don't go swimming in the ocean. You could potentially get stung. Your children could potentially get stung and they could potentially die. But yes, God created this with that in mind. Okay? Knowing that, yes, some people might come in contact with that. Okay? But again, we live in a fallen freaking world. Okay? And while we do have dominion over things like jellyfish, yes, they can be potentially deadly. Okay? And it's not up to you to come up with a magical conversation in your head between God and Jesus about how they talked about, oh, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't have done that, God. Oh, 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 well, sorry, hurry, hit enter, her. What? That never happened. Okay? That only happened in your head. Because in your postmodernist 
hippie god mind, you can't reconcile the two because you're not thinking of free will and the fall, original sin. Although that may sound like a comedy sketch, that very much mirrors the cognitive dissonance going on in a Christian's head, or at least in my head when I was a Christian, between what I expected the creation of God to be like and the personality of that God to be, and what the evidence actually revealed. Well, then, obviously, you, sir, the truth hurts. I'm speaking to you. Obviously, the cognitive dissonance was not about the actual God of the Bible, but it was about this postmodernist bullshit God that those people have created, okay? This, oh, he's so full of love and happiness and kindness and gentleness and goodness that he would never allow you to ever get hurt. He never said that. Ever. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that. Okay? Nowhere in Scripture does it say that you were going to be happy for the rest of your days. That, oh, you're a Christian. Oh, guess what? Everything's just love and roses and sunshine and daisies and, oh, everything's just going to be hunky-dory from here on out. Nowhere does it say that in Scripture. Nowhere. And even Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that there is never a time when God ever said that it would be all sunshine and daisies. So somewhere, someone infected your brain with this idea of a postmodernist God of love and kindness and empathy and foreknowledge. He would never allow that to happen. That's BS. Complete BS. Okay? that you have made up in your mind and then you see things like this and you go, well, why would God create that? Because we live in a fallen freaking world. That's why. Yes, we have dominion over everything. We have dominion over bears. There are people that hunt bears all the time. But there are also people that treat bears like they're freaking cuddly. Like they're a teddy bear. Oh, look at this. Look at this bear. He's so cute. Rawr! Oh, he's just a little angry. Rawr! Yes, that actually happened. There was a man in Oregon, okay, who was going up into the mountains and thinking that bears were these tame little creatures. He got mauled. His girlfriend got mauled by these bears to death. And they had to go up and they had to shoot him and put him down because now they're man-eaters. Are you flipping kidding me? Come on, man. The creation of box jellyfish has absolutely no impact whatsoever on God or his heavenly realm. But it can potentially have a huge impact in our lives. Yes, it can. And that's why I'm saying... We as humans have learned that yes, we need to we need to have a healthy respect for these animals, okay? Because they can kill us. Because we live in a fallen frickin' world, dude. Duh. We are the ones who put warning signs near beaches. Yeah. Who install safety nets and leave out a bottle of vinegar just in case someone gets stung. Yeah. We are the ones at potential risk of death, and our families are the ones who would mourn. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Okay? But if you're a Christian, and say you happen to not heed the signs, and you go out, and you get stung by jellyfish, and you go to heaven, your first thought's probably going to be like, why am I here? And they're going to say, because you were swimming next to the jellyfish. Duh. Now, is God going to let you in? Yes. Jesus, Jesus is going to say, hey, you know what? Your sins are forgiven, my son. But you were an idiot for swimming next to the jellyfish. You can ask God then, why did you create these jellyfish? And he's going to give you the answer that you're not going to want to hear. Because he's God, and you're not. 
And yes, you'll be happy and in heaven, and your family will mourn your death for a while, but they will eventually move on to other things, and they will eventually continue forward in their lives, and they will eventually move on from that, and they will learn. I mean, let's take Steve Irwin for a minute. Okay, that man was amazing. He went to all these different places. He could go and he could, you know, look at crocodiles and he could do things and he was he was being stupid and he swam next to a manta ray, a stingray. And it slashed him straight across his chest with its tail because he was swimming too friggin' close. Guess what? He died. His son is doing the same thing he's doing now. He's doing the same shows. He's doing the same things. And you know what he said? I learned from my father. Not to get close to the stingrays this time. Or to get close to jellyfish or to get close to the snakes. To get close to certain things. Because they could potentially kill me. In fact, hell, there's a fucking guy on YouTube. And I'm not kidding about this. There's a guy on YouTube who gets stung by animals he gets bit by his poisonous spiders he gets stung by carpenter ants or carpenter uh, uh wasp he gets i mean he took a carpenter wasp this long that has a stinger about that long and just stung him he does it so that you understand if you come in contact with something like this this is what potentially you're gonna feel okay so yeah we put up warning signs we tell people if you're swimming a hundred feet, a hundred yards, five thousand yards, you could potentially die. That's the point of living in the fallen world. The jellyfish have those stingers so that they can eat their prey because they can't move the same way that a fish can. Anemones eat the same way. Sea anemones. You know those little things that when you're in the when you're in the, the place you're in the aquarium and they've got that little flowery thing and you stick your fist in it and it goes like this and it kinda of, kinda of reaches in on itself and then it goes back up and then it's wavy. Yeah. That's how they eat. Okay? They have a special gland that secretes a little thing that fish like. And fish will go to it because they think it's food. And they'll get in there and then that thing will close in on them. And eat them. Venus flytraps do the same damn thing. What of it? It's a product of the fall, dude. The Bible says that God knows the stars by name. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. All right? Let's look at that. Psalm 147.4. Hallelujah. Yes, praise the Lord. How good it is to sing his praises. How delightful and how right. He is rebuilding Jerusalem and bringing back the exiles. He heals the brokenhearted, binding up their wounds. He counts the stars and calls them all by name. How great he is. His power is absolute. His understanding is unlimited. The Lord supports the humble but brings the wicked to the dust. Yeah, he knows the stars by name. He also knows the hairs on your head, as he's going to say. He also has the exact number of hairs on our head. Yeah. So we can run over to Luke really fast. So meanwhile, the crowds grew until thousands upon thousands were milling about, crushing each other. He turned now, Jesus, to his disciples and warned them, more than anything else, beware of these Pharisees and the way they pretend to be good when they aren't. But such hypocrisy cannot be hidden forever. It will become evident as yeast in dough. Whatever they have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered in inner rooms shall be broadcast from the housetops for all to hear. Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to murder you. 
They can only kill the body. They have no power over your souls. But I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God who has the power to kill and then cast into hell. What is the price of five sparrows? A couple of pennies? Not much more than that. Yet God does not forget a single one of them. And he knows the number of hairs on your head. Never fear. You are far more valuable to him than a whole flock of sparrows. And I assure you of this. I, the Messiah, will publicly honor you in the presence of angels, of God's angels, if you publicly acknowledge me here on earth as your friend. But I will deny before the angels those who deny me here among men son of a biscuit eater guess what I just read that passage at the beginning you are more valuable than sparrows but don't go swimming in the ocean when there's a bloom of jellyfish God never said you would not have adversity that you would be just protected all the days of your life. Things happen, okay? Let's finish up this one, and then I'll I'll call it an episode, and then we'll, and then when we come back, we'll get back into the other animals here. Numbered. If that is true, then logically he knows the exact coordinates of every single box jellyfish on the planet. Yes, he does. He also knows the specific, precise location of every single human and how close we are to coming into contact with them. Yeah. Based on the track record, through looking at the statistics of deaths and stings, he has no interest in helping us. He Why just should lets he? us get on with it. He takes a back seat. At no point does he decide to try and move the jellyfish away or eradicate them completely. So... I'm going to end it here because there's going to be a, um, an ad. And, well, here, I'll skip that. Um, so, so basically, yes, God knows the exact location of every single box jellyfish. And yes, he knows the location of every human being. Okay? The reason why he doesn't do anything is because of free will. We have the ability to see that there are jellyfish and go, hmm, maybe I shouldn't go swimming out there if there are jellyfish. Or if I see somebody get stung by jellyfish, maybe I should not put myself in that situation where I could potentially get a sting and die. Does that make sense? Okay? It's not up to God to run your whole life. Okay? That's what free will is. God didn't want robots. He wanted people that choose freely to accept him or to not accept him. It's not up to God to say, to come down and go, Whoa there! Don't go swimming in those waters. It's dangerous. In terms of your rebellion, you'd probably just ignore him anyway. Because that's what sin is. Sin is rebellion from God. So we think, oh, <laughs> it's perfectly safe. When I was a kid, I went to Yellowstone National Park. Okay? And they were handing out flyers when you came through the gates. You know what those flyers said? Beware the buffaloes, because they get kind of territorial during mating season. We were there during mating season. It was early summer. It was like June. And they were like, they'll charge. They have horns. Okay? So my parents were like, hey, if we see some buffalo, we'll stay in the car because we don't want to get gored. Right? Hey, guess what? I was sitting there. There was a moose jam. And uh, that, that happens frequently in, in Yellowstone National Park. You get moose jams. And um, so we gotten out, and we were standing there, and my mom looks over, and she's like, hey, look, there's some buffalo out there. So we're sitting there, and we're watching through some binoculars. We're watching some things. And all of a sudden, through the tall grass comes this guy, like, sneaking up to take pictures of the friggin' buffalo. Now, here's nine-year-old me 
because it was a year after the 1988 fires in Yellowstone. Here's nine-year-old me standing there going, I'm about to watch somebody get murdered by a buffalo. Because they're too stupid to heed the damn warning. So if you are going to go to a beach where it says potential danger and let your kids go run out into the water and play, then I'm sorry. I can't feel too sorry. I mean, I'm sorry that you had to go through the pain of burying your child, but at the same time, there's a friggin' sign right there that says, Caution, Jellyfish. So I'm sorry. I can't. I can't feel too sorry for you. Like I said, I care because I'm a human being. I care about all humans in general. Okay? And the loss of a life is a loss of a life. But if you're stupid enough to go out there and put yourself into a situation where you could potentially get killed by something, then I can't feel too sorry for you. That's not being crass. That's just being pragmatic. Okay? That's saying... We know that there's a warning out there for this and you put yourself in that situation willingly and that happened. And I'm sorry it happened, but at the same time, it's one of God's creatures and he designed it that way. We know he designed it that way. We know to stay away from those things. So if you willingly put yourself in that position of going out there and doing that, then I can't feel too sorry for you. I just can't. It's not in my DNA to say, <laughs> you were the stupid one. Because you're like that man that went out there and teased those buffalo. Now, granted, he didn't get murdered by buffalo. Thank God. Because I probably would have been traumatized by it. Nine-year-old me watching a man getting gored and trampled to death by buffalo. That later I probably would have rationalized if the man hadn't done stupid shit, he probably wouldn't have died. You play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. Can't feel too sorry for you. Okay? I'm sorry. That's just how I'm built. Okay? I, I, I can feel sorry for the loss of life. I can empathize with the family. God empathizes with the family. But he'd be saying, why did you let... Why did your parents... I mean, I'm sure he was asking that kid, why were you allowing your parents... Why was your parents allowing you to go swim in that water when they knew that there were jellyfish there? And the kid's probably like, well, I, I don't know. My parents told me it was safe. Obviously, it wasn't safe. Okay? So, that's all. And it's been about 48 minutes. So, I'm going to go ahead and call it an episode. And uh, I hope that you will uh, smash that like button. Um, hit subscribe. Drop a comment down below. Um, keep it locked here, Russ's Movie Corner. And um, when we come back, we'll start getting into the next animal. And uh, we'll kind of go through that animal and um, make sure that they, uh, you know, and and we'll we'll kind of get we'll kind of get done with that animal and and uh, and then there's there's a couple more animals coming um, and then he'll have his conclusion. So I'm I'm probably thinking that there's going to be another three or four videos out of this. Um, probably another three, I would guess just because of how long it's been taking me. So, all right, keep it locked to Russ's Movie Corner, and we will see you later.